Well, I want to wish us all a happy birthday because we're celebrating the birthday of the church. So happy birthday. Happy birthday. You guys always humor me. That's always so nice. I know it's early too. So um, to understand the reading um, in Acts about the birth of the church of this Pentecost, we need to look at um, scripture before uh, the birth of the church in Acts 1. We need to look that Jesus commands the apostles before his ascension in Acts 1. Luke writes, he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to his apostles he had chosen. The resurrected Lord spent 40 days speaking about the kingdom to his apostles. Now he had just risen. He spends those 40 days speaking. Don't you know that the, uh, the disciples, the apostles were listening to every word Jesus had to say. Their crucified, died, and now resurrected teacher was before them giving instruction. They had walked three years in his steps, and now this supernatural defeater of death is giving them orders, giving them commands. You better believe that they were listening to every word. Now, I think quite importantly, in the context of the orders given, they were given during a meal, during a time of fellowship. That's when the Lord gives these commands. They're eating, and the Lord lets them in on what God is about to do on this earth. He tells them they're to receive a special gift, a special gift from the Father Jesus speaks to them about. Now, I don't know about you. When I hear I'm receiving a special gift, and if I'm, I'm receiving that special gift from God, my natural response would be, where do I go? What do I do to get this? Surely the quest to the gift is a part of my earning, my worthiness to receive a gift from a holy God. So in our reading, in the context of true fellowship, in unity, our Lord commands what? Two things. Stay and wait. Stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit from God, our Father. Stay and wait. Perhaps, at least to me, the two most uninspiring commands ever given by our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay and wait. Now, stay at first hearing would be a call maybe at first hearing to action. Excuse me, let me start again. Stay would at first hearing be a call not to action, but maybe seen as apathy. But we learn that staying would be a powerful and a strategic move. Staying included praying right up until Jerusalem would be filled with thousands of Jewish believers for the Feast of Pentecost. Can you imagine that the first instructions earlier in Acts at the end of Luke from the soon to ascend Savior of the world was to stay. Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift that my Father has promised. Ten days staying and praying. We read, and they were praying with one accord. The Greek in this text is very expressive. It signifies they were all of one mind. Their affections, their desires, their wishes were concentrated on one thing. Everyone having that same end in view. And having but one desire. They had but one prayer for God and every heart in that room uttered it. If you remember the Gospels, while Jesus was with them, there were arguments and there was strife among the disciples about who was the greatest among them. But now it seems all that divisiveness is at an end. We hear no more of it. Maybe what they had received already of the Holy Spirit when Christ breathed the Spirit on them had fixed the mistakes upon which those contexts and those assumptions were grounded. They had overcome those with love. They had prayed more together of late than usual, and this made them love one another better. By his grace, Jesus prepared them for this gift of the Holy Spirit to be received from the Father. Would we have the Spirit poured out upon us from on high? Let us all be of one accord, and in spite of a variety of opinions and interests, as no doubt there were among the disciples, let us all agree to love one another. For where brethren and sistren, I don't think that's a word, but I like that, sistren dwell together, where we dwell together in unity, there is that Lord and that command for his blessing. 
This community we read in scripture had waited on the Lord together and as a result, they were united and of one mind in their waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not good at waiting. I don't like to wait in traffic. I don't like to wait for my coffee. I don't like to wait for someone to pick up the phone. I am lousy at waiting. So what does God's word say about it? Isaiah 30, 18, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lamentations 3, 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So in our reading today in Acts, then after the disciples wait in obedience, in unity, and in prayer, the Holy Spirit comes. Now, as we watch our nation deal with the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, let us not think that we can do nothing. Prayer and waiting have been part of the lives of people of color for generations Prayer allows for hope that things would change for the better. Prayer also invites our supernatural God to intervene and to bring justice and change. We must be in unity in prayer for that change. But we cannot use our prayer life as an excuse not to act and to call out evil for what it is. Praying is good, but also the world needs to see a witness of believers that are against the evils of this world, including racism. Outside of that room in Jerusalem, it was Pentecost, and that was one of the big Jewish feast days. Only they didn't call it Pentecost. That's the Greek name for it. The Jews called it Shuvot, the Feast of the Harvest, or the Feast of Weeks. Now, there are some things you need to know about Pentecost that will help you understand how strategic Acts 2 is. Pentecost was a pilgrim festival. That meant that according to Jewish law, all the adult Jewish men would come from wherever they were living to Jerusalem and personally be in attendance during the celebration. Pentecost was a holiday. No servant work was to be done. School was out. The shops were closed. It was party time, time to celebrate. And there were certain celebrations and sacrifices and offerings which were prescribed in the law for that specific day of Pentecost. On Pentecost, the high priest was to take two loaves of freshly baked bread and offer them before the Lord. The wheat bread was made from the newly harvested wheat. Pentecost, in the time of the apostles, was a grand harvest celebration. The streets of Jerusalem were packed with thousands of pilgrims, and they'd come from everywhere, every nation, to celebrate the goodness of God and his bringing of the wheat harvest. The early church the early church had none of the things that you think would be essential for our church today. Buildings, budgets, influence, status, I'll throw in social media. And yet, the church won thousands to Christ and saw churches established all through the Roman world. How? Why? Because the church had the power of the Holy Spirit energizing, fueling the fires of ministry. They were a people ignited by the Spirit of God and united in prayer, united in purpose. That same Holy Spirit power, Holy Spirit fire is available to us today to make us more effective witnesses to Christ. The better we understand the Spirit work at Pentecost, the better we can relate to Him and experience His power. According to John 16, 14, the ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Christ in the life and the witness of the believer. So let's look at what that early church did. There was no wind, but the sound of a mighty wind, and no fire, but tongues resembling fire, we read at Pentecost. Despite this, wind and fire are very suggestive symbols of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is represented by the wind. The wind is gentle. The wind is powerful. The wind is invisible. The wind is the breath of life itself from God. Fire 
It represents the Holy Spirit in that it gives light, it shines, it provides warmth, it purifies, and it's a symbol of God himself in the Old Testament when he speaks. Then appeared tongues of fire that separated and landed on each one of them praying in the upper room. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, it doesn't say that they were understanding or even conversing in these spirit-enabled languages, but were speaking in other languages. Imagine the surprise and wonder as these Galilean brothers who had walked together three years hear their fellow followers of Christ speak, but like they were from somewhere else. Wow. Unbelievable. I guess they just looked and heard each other in wonder and in awe of the Lord acting. How wonderful that God would want the church to start with those who were from somewhere else. Then they were praying and preparing for that. The purpose of these unintelligible words, these languages to the anointed may have been completely lost to them as they were speaking. But that would not be for long. What? What if this was a gifting, an anointing particular to the thing God wanted to accomplish in that situation and in that location for that time that they were in? What if the point of the Holy Spirit gifting them with tongues wasn't to make them just to be able to speak another language? What if the point was for them to declare the wonders of God in a way that those outside of their little room, outside of their gathering, could receive? They could see and hear and understand. It wasn't just a filling of the Spirit, but an equipping by the Spirit to serve those outside the Spirit-filled house of believers, outside the church from all over the world. Not all Jews spoke Hebrew fluently. Aramaic was more common. Jews from other places were weak on their Aramaic too. Greek was the worldwide language of the day. But most people had as their first language their region and ethnic dialect. These celebrating Jews that had come for Pentecost were amazed and astonished, for they were hearing God's mighty works in their native language, in their dialect. What may have been amazing but not understood in the house was the very thing that God used to tell of God's mighty works outside to Jerusalem. God uses language to bring people from different cultures, from different backgrounds, from different races and places to a place of fellowship, to a place of unity. God, through his Holy Spirit, was equipping the disciples to go beyond their circle of Jews and use language to invite believers from every nation to hear in their language about the wonders of God. So now, the release of power in the Holy Spirit was not for the chosen people in the upper room to wield it as they saw fit to those people that looked or talked just like them. God will not have that. God sees the heart, not the race or the country of origin or the culture. God sees the heart. Amen? Amen. So it's no mistake that the start of the church is to empower leaders to share God with people that they don't even know the languages of. People that aren't just like them. It's interesting in our reading that the first sermon in the newly anointed church was to clear up a misconception of those in our church to those outside of it. Peter doesn't avoid controversy, but he addresses it directly and rationally to draw in his listeners, devout Jews, And then he ties it to the prophets. He ties it to Joel. A vision of the Spirit poured out on all flesh. Sons and daughters prophesying. Young men having visions. Old men dreaming dreams. Even the servants are prophesying. Peter reminds the listeners that supernatural acts of the Spirit are part of Hebrew Scripture. And are not out of the realms of God's acting. Peter relates the signs in the Joel passage of the day of the Lord and how everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The devout Jews listening would be familiar with these prophecies and know of God's judgment upon them. 
And again, Peter relates that the Spirit is poured out on all flesh, not just to certain shades of flesh, every ethnic background, every culture, every race. What we don't get to read is the rest of the story in our reading of Peter's powerful word to Jerusalem at Pentecost. He tells them of Jesus of Nazareth, a man authorized by God, but handed over to the Jews to be crucified and then to die. But death could not hold him. Jesus is raised and he's received at the right hand of God. And you have now seen and heard the outpouring of God's promised Holy Spirit, Peter preaches. God made Jesus Lord and Christ and Jews crucified him. The Jews asked, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. 3,000 were baptized that day. 3,000. What a great day of the Lord that must have been for the Lord, for the disciples, for Jerusalem. We call Pentecost the birthday of the church, and it was a day that followed 10 days of obedient prayer and waiting in unity. A day where a supernatural encounter provides a means, a means for believers to cross cultural, ethnic, and language barriers to help others hear of the wonders of our God. A day that brought the filling of the disciples with the promised Holy Spirit, which brought supernatural abilities to speak in foreign languages. Then a word by Peter would bring the people to call upon the name of the Lord so that they would be saved, repent. 3,000 that day. This all started with obedience. Obedience, followers of Christ being united, praying. Then God filled those that stayed and prayed to him with this Holy Spirit. They were anointed with gifts I'm pretty certain they were not expecting to have and certainly not to use. God used them in a specific way with the anointing of the Spirit given to them. The supernatural act of the Spirit crossed cultural, ethnic, and geographic lines to allow them to hear about the mighty works of God in their language. We, we are called to repent and to be baptized by the Holy Spirit in a specific way, I think, for this specific time. Let us pray today for a call to repentance and to have our nation's authorities see citizens, all citizens, with the eyes of Christ. So Church of St. Clement, let us stay in El Paso, in your pew, or at your home if you're watching. Let us be united in Christ. Let us stay and pray in one accord. Let this be a strategic time the Lord is preparing us for, a time where maybe language isn't the barrier, but skin color. Racism in its subtlest form is an act of evil, and it has no place in the work of the church. Then we wait. Wait on the Spirit to act and to equip us for what God's needs are to be done. What I find so fascinating about Pentecost is a particular gift given to be used at the particular time when Jerusalem would be full of devout Jews from all nations allowing for those multiple languages to be recognized, but also for the telling of the mighty works of God to have the largest impact. This is not to say that speaking in other languages is not a sign of the Spirit falling or or of filling people. Scripture clearly shows that some who were hearing Peter speak at Cornelius' home had the Spirit fall on them. And as they heard the word, they spoke in tongues and they asked to be baptized by Peter. These were Jews and not Gentiles, or Jews and non-Jews. Speaking in other languages in God's word can be evidence of the Spirit falling. I guess I'm saying that be ready for our being filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Have us do things we never have or even thought of doing before. That the Spirit would fall on whites and non-whites, on Protestants and non-Protestants, and equip us to reach beyond those who don't look like us, who don't talk like us. That begins by praying for eyes to see others, other ethnicities, other races, other educational and economic statuses, other countries of origin, to see those others with the eyes of Christ. When we believers see, when we believers, excuse me, let me get a little more water. When we believers see evil, wrongly put its knee down on the neck of someone, that they have power and authority over, 
We believers must see that as evil. We believers must see that as injustice. We believers must see that as wrong, a wrong use of that power, a wrong use of that authority, and above all, as unchristian. We read in Micah 6, 8, he has shown you a mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In Isaiah 59, justice is turned back and righteousness stands forever far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. I wanted to hit home with this point by, by re referring to something that happened nine to 10 months ago, August 3rd, 2019. Some goof from far away gets a gun. Now there's authorities to get a gun the right way, but he gets one. This goof comes to El Paso, he goes to a Walmart, and he has power. He has power, and he's used with authority to have this gun. And he takes this gun, and he's shooting anybody, in my, my mind, anybody that looks Mexican. That's his, that's his qualifier. You look Mexican, pop. I'm going to kill you. The outrage, not just from this community, but from the, the nation and the world, was uniting. It was like, this guy is a goof. This guy is not uh, a representative of people getting guns. He's not a representative of all the youth. He's not a representative of, of people uh, that are different from each other. But we all united against him. Now, to make my point, I want you to imagine that not only that happened and that he shot people because, why, because of how they looked and used that force wrongly, I want you to imagine that he was not a young man, but he was a white police officer. Now imagine that and what we would do. Let us repent as those 3,000 before Peter did. Let us repent of our apathy when injustice comes against any of our brothers and sisters made in the image of God. Let us pray for what the Spirit would baptize us to do, and it might be things we've never done before. This is not a white thing. This is not a Mexican thing. This is not a black thing. This is a godly thing to call for justice for the oppressed and to punish the evildoer. We stay and we pray with one accord and we ask God to act. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord, we, we know this is a specific incident. Not all people are bad. Not all policemen are bad. We know that not um, all, all the people that are doing these riots have justice in mind. But Lord, I can say that we are all broken and that we are all sinful. And I pray, Lord, in unity by your Holy Spirit that you would anoint us, that you would heal us. I pray, Almighty God, on this day through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you reveal the way of eternal life to every race and every nation. Pour out this gift anew that by the preaching of the gospel, your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, almighty God, you created us in your own image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us to use our freedom rightly in the establishment of justice in our communities and among the nations. All of this to the glory of your holy name. Because what we want to do is point people to you, Lord. We want to point people to you. And we, want, we know that authorities are put by your, um, you allow authority and you allow those people to, to have power over us. We just bless, we bless those who are over us, Lord. But we ask that when people misuse that power, that we would call it for what it is so that we can be a light to this nation and to this world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.